We have been deeply rooted in our San Antonio Beer County communities for 121 years now. So we are extremely pleased to see all of you here today. We know there are others who are scheduled. This was a sold out event, but we know that construction and traffic and all that is playing a role. I uh, hope you had a chance to get some of our food and drink from Pico de Gallo, which is right up front. A little bit of housekeeping. We are going to have a schedule break. If you do need to use the facilities, there are restrooms right outside the door. Women's on the right of the check-in and men's on the left of the check-in. Um, we are so excited to be doing this event today. Uh, it is our first time pulling something together like this, as you saw in the registration. We are here to help uh, inform and elevate discussion and work on how to readdress those root cause challenges and the child lives of the children and the families that we all serve. You know, as we all know, we work so hard to try to help address what too often are intergenerational challenges in people's lives tied to either poverty or, or a lot of those life stressors based on where they're born, raised, live, or play and age. And so you all are engaged in that, but so often we get involved with addressing the symptoms and we never have the capacity to start addressing those root cause challenges to make that definitive difference. And if you're looking at our life and community as a tapestry, we all have different threads that we're engaging on. And if we have those threads that are out of sync or you know not aligned or fall out of place, it's hard to put them back in. And so then we get frustrated when we think we've quote unquote solved the problem, but we know we haven't because all these other issues are still affecting the lives of those we serve. So what we're hoping to do today, with the help of our sponsors of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Texas, as well as Methodist Healthcare Ministries, and you know many other partners, is we have partnered with Children at Risk, who is an amazing statewide policy advocacy group that works to address and help you know advocate on behalf of children and families across many different areas. We have been able to bring together a very esteemed statewide panel of experts that work in these different areas. I want to um, introduce them because Dr. Bob Sanborn will, but I'm glad that we have been able to bring them here to San Antonio to show that, you know, one, we're not in this alone. Some of these threads are very common across our state and our country, as we well know, but there are things that are unique to San Antonio, which we'll have a chance to hear a little bit about as well from Dr. Sanborn. So, you know, think about this, and of course our challenge is, is when we finish this conversation this morning, what can you take back in the work that you do to help you know, improve on that bigger picture of all of us working together to try to make positive change happen, to make sustainable lifetime changes for our children and our families. So think about if you want to wait till the end, you're welcome to do so. We also have QR codes that you can um, um, you know, send the questions to. You are also to ask questions during the time as well. But we are very grateful to have you today. Thank you so much for all the work that you do. At this point, if I haven't left anything out, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Bob Sanborn. Also, want to thank my team because they've worked so hard on this, along with the children of this team, too, to pull this together. Thank you. I'm Bob Sanborn, President and CEO of Children at Risk. We're a statewide advocacy group. And we love coming to San Antonio, and um, today presenting was going to be uh, Chris, uh, Christine Thomas, who is, lives in San Antonio, is one of our lead researchers. But Christine uh, had little Aurelia earlier uh, this week, so uh, good for Christine. Right? So, it's amazing. For so many people that care about kids, how few people plotted, right? They must have kids of their own, I'm just saying. But they can all. Uh, I know I know a lot of you uh, from Zoom, right? So I've seen a lot of you on Zoom meetings. And one of the things people always say with Zoom is they say, oh, Bob, you're so much taller. And so inside I'm thinking, I wish they would say you're so much better looking at this. They say that about me too. They say so much that you're, you're not as tall as you thought. Yeah. So um, uh, Kim Parker is here. She's the chief uh, program officer. Uh, from Children at Risk and is in Austin, is in our Austin area. And uh, so we're excited to talk a little bit about and present a little bit some of the data around San Antonio uh, and Texas and how it compares and how we're looking at some of the real key challenges that we're seeing in Texas and in San Antonio. You know, we have, uh, Texas is a very unique state. Uh, there's a lot of wealth in Texas, but we have a lot of disparities, right? And we see in San Antonio sort of a, a face of Texas 
uh, that is unique, uh, but so many things that are sort of common challenges in San Antonio are also common challenges around the state. So we'll get into some of this. Kim, how are you doing today? I am doing great. It's so great to see so many friendly faces. I'm excited to have this conversation today. We've been building up this for almost a year uh, that we've been partnering on this project and exciting to see it finally here. Real quick, we have a really special kind of announcement, so I'm going to turn it back over to Mary really quick. Okay, special announcement. So I forgot to mention, you know, all of our sectors have to work together, whether it's education or healthcare, community-based organizations, etc. But also we can't do it without our uh, public officials our local, um, county, state, federal government. And we are excited that we do have District Councilwoman uh, from District 1, Dr. Um, Sukkor is joining us today, along with Rick Galvan, who is representing District 5, Terry Castillo. I don't know if they made it here yet, but they are scheduled to be here this morning, and we appreciate their interest and engagement in these important topics. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely, thank you so much. Thank you, Mary. Yeah. All right, everybody ready to dive in? I wanna say one more thing. Um, one of the things that we do at Children Risk is we have a group called the Texas Family Leadership Council. And Mary and I, Deb Zulaga and I, were the, were the sort of founding board of this. And during the pandemic, uh, we brought together uh, nonprofits from all over the state that we met every week, which seems like a lot, but remember during the pandemic, we weren't getting out much. So uh, we met every week, and it was really amazing because state experts would come and talk to us about what was going on, and every week we would have an infectious disease, pediatric infectious disease expert letting us know what was going on. And so I just want to thank Mary and Deb and all of the, all of you who've been part of some of those phone calls. It continues today because we've realized it's a great advocacy tool. We've had legislation that has passed because of the work of the Texas Family Leadership Council. So yeah, but let's go ahead. What do we have first? Yeah. All right, let's dive in. So when we're looking at what we want to do today with our data review is the most important part of today is really our conversation with the panelists, right? Bringing in ideas and thoughts, thinking about innovation, and uh, really um, problem solving some of these issues. But what we wanted to do first was just level set the data, right? So making sure everybody's kind of starting at the same foundation, the same starting point. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through some very basic demographics that I'm sure most of you all are pretty familiar with being from San Antonio. Take a look at the snapshot of challenges ahead, and then focus on the needs, resilience, and a path forward. So that by the time we end today's session, we'll have some ideas about some creative solutions to these problems that the entire state struggles with. Yeah, we have a fantastic panel right we after do. us to sort of react to some of this stuff. Yeah. We do. All right, so let's dive into some just basic demographics so we're setting the stage for today's conversation. Yeah, so when we look at kids uh, just in the greater San Antonio area, and we're talking about uh, Bear County and beyond, uh, right around San Antonio. So, yeah, 635,000 kids, it's a lot of children. There are about 7.5 million children in the state of Texas, uh, but this is the number of kids under 18, under 18, and then public school kids, uh, close to 300,000. So, a lot of kids uh, that we see in this area. Uh, actually, go back, because I did that wrong. Public school children that are economically disadvantaged, right? Not just public school children. All right, so when we're looking at the racial and ethnic breakdown of the San Antonio area, um, what we're looking at is that primarily San Antonio is made up of people of color. Um, however, those demographics actually are shifting. I'm sure it's no surprise to any of you who will live here that people are moving into San Antonio. Um, San Antonio is being a city that um, has a lot of development. People are really excited to move to San Antonio, really excited about the, the culture and flair of the San Antonio community. And so what we're, what we're seeing is that although uh, people of color make up most of San Antonio, um, it is slowly um, moving so that there are more people um, with, who are white who are moving into the city slowly. So those demographics are shifting. However, again, primarily Hispanic, Latino. And here, this is an interesting thing because this is the greater San Antonio area. If we were to focus specifically on Bear County, it would be different, much more Latino, uh, it would it'd be quite different actually. So we're looking at the greater area. Mm -hmm. But when we look at the state of Texas and in San Antonio, here is the key thing that we're seeing. We're becoming more and more Latino as a state. So for every white baby born in Texas, 17 Latino babies are born. And, and it's not that we're having bigger Latino families. It's that the Latino population is young in Texas, right? It's a young, it's a young population. And you know, if you're over 70 and white, you can try as hard as you can, but you're probably not gonna have kids. And so, uh, and so we have a much older white population in our state. And, uh, and so it's important to understand that when we look at San Antonio and some of the key challenges, especially facing the Latino community, 
those are going to be challenges facing Texas as we move forward because not only are we talking more Latino, 66% of all babies born in Texas Latino. Uh, we're, we're not only talking about Latino, but we still have significant disparities in terms of income, right? And so a lot of our Latino families are lower income. And so that's something that we're going to have to look at. And that is the greatest hurdle, right, to success for children, is what is the income level of their parents? We all know those kids that beat the odds, but we don't have a system that helps kids beat the odds. And so what we'll talk about today is how do we try to change that system? How do we try to change some of the mitigators that are out there so that more children can be successful? Absolutely, and that's what we really want to talk about. So when we're looking at, demographics just tell you numbers, right? So then we have to really look at the social determinants of health. What are the things that are impacting the people who live here? Um, and it's far outweighs just who you are, but we're looking at economic stability, educational access, and the quality of the education that they are receiving. We're looking at health care access and the quality of the health care that they are receiving. And we're also looking at just the general context of a community. So what is it like to live in specific communities in San Antonio? What is the experience of those living there? That is the social determinants of health. And they absolutely impact the overall outcomes um, that those families and those children experience. And when you have a relatively uh, poor city, right, San Antonio doesn't have, there is wealth, but relatively when you look across, there's a lot of a lot of low-income families. When you look at that and you look at economic stability, you realize this becomes one of our greatest obstacles. But we're not, we don't really have a system that's going to change that because Texas focuses on work. You have to work. But what we have in San Antonio and in Texas are a lot of low-income families that are working, right? We're, we're, they're all working, uh, but it's not necessary. You're not, the families are not necessarily getting ahead like we'd like them to be. So we're not going to change the system. So what it does is that it puts burdens on these other three areas. Like how do we sort of excel in education and in healthcare and in the social and community context? How do we excel in those areas to make sure that we can level the playing field for our children? So what are the things that we're going to do uh, in, in extraordinary ways in these other uh, areas to make sure that we're successful for our children? So looking at poverty, and um, there's two different data points that we wanted to share with you. There is what is considered the poverty line, which I'm sure most of you all are familiar with, which is 31.5 for a family of four. So in San Antonio, we have 15.4. That's an annual income of 31,000. Annual income of 31,000 for four, for yeah, four for people. Four. Um, but then we also look at economically disadvantaged. And Dr. Bob, I think you're perfect to explain kind of why we consider that a really important metric. This is a better metric of how our kids are doing because this is the number of kids that qualify for free and reduced school lunch, right? So these are low-income families. And even that, we know that at the high school level, a lot of kids don't want to do any sort of declare themselves in need of free and school lunch. So even the 67% is probably undercounted. The other thing is that when you look at just below the federal poverty line, what people often don't talk about is that in Texas, there are about half a million children that are considered to be in extreme poverty, which means that their families earn less than $10,000 a year. And this includes any benefits that they would get. And so uh, this is extraordinary, right, that we have half a million children that are living in extreme poverty in the state of Texas. So it's a big deal. Yeah, and I think it's important for us to recognize that definitions do matter, right? So we often talk about poverty line, but that does not provide the context for actually how families are living, the results of inflation, how expensive rent is, um, but the economically disadvantaged does help support, like actually these are children and families that are significantly struggling, that they need public benefits, um, and we should be looking at much broader than just the definition of poverty line. And one of the things that, uh, one of the underlying things uh, through all of this is that Texas does not, families in Texas tend not to claim the benefits uh, that they qualify for. Uh, actually in San Antonio, a higher level of claiming those benefits than in some other cities, but as a whole, Texans do not claim benefits, and as a whole, even more so, Latinos do not claim benefits. And so it's one of the other things, it's one of the struggles for us, and uh, I have a radio show, and I was talking with the head of the Houston Food Bank, and we talked about <clears throat> the number of families just in Houston that do not claim benefits for SNAP, for food stamps. And if, we, if those families that qualify did do this, this all in the state, what a boon it would be for grocery stores and an economic boost to the community. Moreover, those families would not be struggling for food, right? And so it's one of the things that we have to do, uh, that we have to take on sort of in the nonprofit sector because the government 
Uh, certainly the state government is not going to do more to make it easy, more easily accessible to get some of those benefits. If anything, they make it more difficult. And so we have to be that counterbalance as a community to say, how do we make sure uh, that this works? And interestingly, federally, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, which gives up, which does free breakfast, which does SNAP, which does WIC, whenever I meet with them, they are overjoyed with any sort of outside-of-the-box thinking. They really want to figure this out. And I will say that U.S. Department of Agriculture, even during Republican administrations, they're always trying to figure out how do we feed uh, low-income families, how do we feed children. And so it's something that's sort of interesting that, uh, you know, a couple of, oh, maybe it's 10 years, but it hasn't stopped me from talking about it. But 10 years ago, we, we mandated, we had a piece of legislation that mandated that school districts had to figure out a way to school, serve school breakfast. And when that law passed, a million more children every day were getting, were getting breakfast. But what we've noticed is that a lot of school districts, uh, uh, and the, one, the school districts that excel at sort of getting kids the free school lunch and breakfast are the ones in San Antonio and in the Valley. Uh, but around the state, we've noticed some schools that are just sort of slacking off on this. And, and so this whole idea of claiming benefits, very, very important. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that brings us to like the, con the idea about talking about really food, what is food insecurity and how prevalent is it? And what we see is that obviously Texas is not performing well compared to the national average, um, but unfortunately Bayer County is performing even a little bit worse than Texas um, average. Um, and that there are a high number of children that are insanely food insecure and that there are even more that are not, um, are ineligible for federal nutrition programs. And so um, really leaning into the idea of how can we utilize the systems that are in place, um, how can we ensure that children are receiving free and reduced breakfast and lunch in school settings um, so that we can ensure kids are fed. Um, but we do know that the average's participation has been declining since COVID. I um, mean, there's definitely some problems and in, in barriers in that system that are allowing those children to be fed. One of the things that happened during COVID is that the U.S. Department of Agriculture, uh, under both Trump and Biden, uh, sort of figured out ways during the pandemic to make it super easy for, for schools. And so what you had is, you know, no paperwork, make it easy, let's feed everyone. After the, pan after the pandemic now, the, some of those rules are being reinstated and some schools are having trouble sort of getting up to speed. So what we're seeing is that overall, the number of kids having school breakfast, school lunch has been decreasing, including in San Antonio. And part of that is because the rules have become more tough. Now, do we think that kids were like trying to skirt the law and eat more? You know, uh, I, bully to them, right? And more, more power to them for doing that if they were. But we know they weren't. So it's sort of, it's interesting when you talk to the Department of Agriculture, they yeah, yeah, we get it. We should probably just make the rules easy. But Congress does not, you know, Congress makes it very difficult. So one of the other challenges we see really is that um, early education and cover child care coverage, right? Especially high quality, affordable child care. We, we know that that is a challenge. It has gotten worse since the pandemic when we saw a lot of child care facilities have to close. Um, and so what, we're, what you're looking at is the total number of seats available within this area, but then more importantly is the total child care seats per 100 working parents. And what you'll see is there are only 53.5 available seats per working parent. So um, what we have is we have child care deserts, places where there are not enough child care facilities um, that are needed for parents who are working. And so parents are having to figure out and problem solve how they can have child care coverage so that they can get their family's needs met. And I want to preface talking about early education uh, with a little bit of a story. So uh, when I came to Children at Risk, um, I took my own personal background. I'd worked at Rice University. I was a first generation college. I grew up in Puerto Rico, first one in my family to ever go to college. Uh, and I really, that, that whole idea of going off to college and seeing the world in a very different way and being successful. And so my thought was, this is what we need to do, more kids need to go to good high schools and go to college and graduate, and this can be a big game changer. And I thought, if maybe this can be the equalizer. And it's sort of in the back of the, my mind as I went to Children at Risk. We're working on the whole child, we're working around it statewide, but, but that was sort of my motivation. As you start doing the research, and you start seeing some of the best practices, and you start seeing what's going on, you realize that the best bang for your public dollar buck is probably not even probably, it is early education, right? And so if we could only do one thing, we would focus on high quality early education for low income families, right? Uh, high quality childcare, uh, this is the key, right? And, and it's interesting, 
For better or for worse, Children at Risk has been doing school rankings for 19 years, right? Some school districts hate it that we rank them, uh, but we rank these schools. And when we see a high-performing, uh, high-poverty school, you know, over 75% low income, inevitably, the only thing that, that's sort of the, there's a number of things that we see that, are, that they're doing, but the one thing that's a common denominator is that those kids came from a background where they're doing high quality early education. So really to see success with low income families, you have to focus on early education. And interestingly, in Texas, uh, you know, there aren't many red states that focus on early education. And you've seen states like Florida that have said, you know, this is a private business, these are private businesses, we're not gonna really focus on it. And so you've seen very little happen. However, in Texas, we've had a different, you know, we've had champions, and so, Governor Abbott has been a champion for early education. This current Speaker of the House is a champion for early education. And so you need to have the majority party there to, to make sure that you can get where you want to go. We still don't get enough state dollars. And one of the things that's interesting is that the Workforce Commission in Texas is almost fully funded by federal dollars for child care subsidies. So you think Workforce Commission is all about the workforce and getting people to work. Almost their entire budget is federal child care subsidies. And so Texas gets a lot of this, these child care subsidies. Uh, we don't get enough. And in most states, the state matches the federal, uh, or at least they give some. And so that's going to be important as we move into the future, knowing that early education is number one. And San Antonio understands this, right? When you had Mayor Castro and he said, let's do pre-K for SA, he was sort of figuring this out, like, oh, this is the key. High quality pre-K is the key. High quality early education is the key. So when we look across at early education, and we see that in San Antonio, did you skip? Oh, I did because you were talking about subsidies. That was, that was going to, yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, when we look at the number of total early child care seats uh, uh, that we have in the greater San Antonio, 72,000, which seems like a lot, uh, but that's really for working parents. That means there's only 53 seats for every 100 parents that are looking for child care, right? Uh, and that's overall. Now when we look at subsidies, and, and I, we love these desert maps, these child care desert maps. This is something that Children at Risk does all over the state. And I'll tell you a story about this. One of the ways that we get our state legislature uh, to be supportive is we go district, uh, state representative district by district or senate district by district, and we create a little one sheet. And we do the child care desert map just for their area. And then we, we put the picture of the legislator on there, and, <laughs> and it's interesting, we give them all this information, and when we give them the sheet, the one sheet, what's the first thing they say? Oh, my picture's on there. <laughs> and it's so, it's so funny, right, because it's so what you'd expect from a politician, but then they, they're able to look, and they're able to see that it's not a problem with those kids. These are kids in my district. These are some child care deserts in my district, and so it's been a very powerful tool for us. All right. So talking about subsidies, um, you know, what we're talking about is how can we make child care more affordable, early education more affordable. Um, and so there is kind of split into two things, the subsidies, so how can we subsidize early education? And then also, how can we ensure high quality child care seats that are available? And that is Texas Rising Star. So as you see, we have a really big gap between uh, the number of subsidies and then the number of high quality Texas Rising Star seats. And so one of the things that we're interested in and doing and we do with partners around the state is really ensuring, ensuring that we're trying to close that gap. We need to close the gap. We need more subsidies and we need more high quality seats in place. So we're still talking about that same hundred, right? The same hundred working parents looking for childcare. There are 50 odd seats for them, but then when we get into the subsidized seats, which helps them, 29 uh, out of those hundred, but then high quality subsidized seats, only eight, right? Yeah. Um, now, the good news is that we did pass legislation to move all of those kids into the high quality. In other words, if you're getting a subsidy uh, in the next few years, you're going to have to be part of the Texas Rising Star system so that, uh, so that you will be focused on making sure it's higher quality. So our job, in, in with these early edu education providers, the child care providers, is helping them get to that point where they could start looking at the quality. And then moreover, our job is making sure we get them more money uh, for those subsidies so we can have more families there. So leaving off early education and moving in K through 12, um, just looking at the, the breakdown of economically disadvantaged, like we said, it was 67% of school-aged children, public school children in San Antonio are economically disadvantaged. 
Um, and 12% emerge in bilingual. And Dr. Bobby, you want to share a little bit more about that? Yeah, so emergent bilingual, right, is sort of the new terminology for English language learners. Uh, and by and large, these are kids that are speaking a different language when they come into the system. San Antonio historically has not had a lot of emergent bilingual. Uh, but that is changing, and that's changing in communities all across our state. So there are certain cities, uh, Houston being one of them, uh, Dallas, where there's been larger numbers of immigrants, right? They've been destination places for immigrants. But as we have more and more immigrants, they're starting to stop at cities they didn't stop in before. El Paso, San Antonio, uh, and they're Fort Worth. And they're, they're stopping there and they're staying. And so that uh, puts this burden on our school systems. Uh, but interestingly, when you look, so when you look at Dallas and you look at uh, Houston, about half of the kids in those cities are children of immigrants or immigrants themselves. Children of first generation immigrants or immigrants themselves. When you look at the state of Texas, a third of all of our children are immigrants themselves or children of first generation, generation immigrants. So that's a third of the kids. And so one of the things we'll tell the governor, right, is that you're demonizing immigrants. But this is a third of our workforce across the state of Texas. And so it's very important, right? So we'll, we'll talk about mental health, but how do you think a child, or certainly that mom and dad feel, when they're being demonized uh, day in and day out? Uh, by the governor in this state that they are part of the workforce, right? So it's it, it we sometimes have a disconnect there, but there's a real connect for a lot of these families So Dr. Bob, you were mentioning our school rankings earlier And I thought we decided we wanted to kind of touch a little bit more about the importance of gold ribbon schools and what that What those opportunities are? Yeah, one of the things that uh, we work with the TEA to come out with our school rankings and one of the things that they have always liked and they I think they would rather we just focus on this part of our rankings and let them do the other stuff. But the minute we have a change in TA commissioner, we have to hold everybody accountable. So we, we feel like we're gonna keep doing them. But these gold ribbons are basically, uh, for a traditional school, which is a non-charter school, which is a non-magnet uh, school as designated by the TA. So for regular school, if we look across the state and we look at those regular schools that have over 75% of the kids that are low income, how, you know, where are the ones that are doing well? And I can tell you that when we started doing these rankings 19 years ago, there were none. You know, I thought, let's find these schools and we'll be able to do, but there, were, there really were no schools. Now, uh, we find there are more and more. The biggest number of them in, are in the highest poverty part of our state, in the Rio Grande Valley, which is the oddest little thing, right, that you'd find the highest performing uh, uh, high poverty schools would get, are gonna be in the valley. <clears throat> but, we still look at every city. And in San Antonio, 5% of the schools that are eligible uh, <clears throat> get that gold ribbon rate. <clears throat> and these are the top five gold ribbon. And the reason we do this also is for us to use these as, as examples, right? If we look at these schools, what are the things that are happening at these schools that we might be able to replicate? Because the majority of our kids are these low-income kids. So how do we make sure that we're sending our kids to these schools that, you know, if this levels the playing field, if schools, public schools are the great equalizer, well then let's equalize them. Let's make sure kids are going to the best quality schools. A lot of this burden, because the state refuses to pony up a lot of the money that needs to be uh, happening, including we had a $33 billion surplus, no pay raise for teachers. What the heck, right? And, and, and continually we see some of these things that are just ridiculous. Like, we, if, if it is going to be a great equalizer, let's make it a great equalizer. So we're doing our darndest to sort of show what are some of those things uh, that are going to work. And I think our next slide has some of those, right? So <clears throat> the most important one is the full day pre-K. Uh, full day high quality pre-K, and really before that, uh, high quality early education probably is the biggest indicator uh, of whether there's going to be success there. Moreover, whenever <clears throat> kids can go in uh, a cohort from pre-K into K, like all together, even, even it's even stronger, right? And so one of the things that I've talked to Sarah Beret at Pre-K for SA a lot is this idea that, you know, you go to these high, this high quality Pre-K for SA, but then kids are going out to other little uh, uh, other schools. And so sometimes there's two kids that went to high quality Pre-K in a class of 20, and so it's, the common denominator is to teach to the 18, not to the two. And so one of the things that we, we really need to work on is making sure kids go as a cohort from pre-K into K. But some of the other things, following the data, 
Uh, we have uh, so much data in Texas on kids that we can intervene pretty quickly. Uh, when you do a meta-analysis internationally of the number one thing that seems to work uh, across cultures uh, in ter terms of turning around schools, it's creating a culture of high expectations. And one of the things you see sometimes when you go into a school is how teachers have posted the, the banners where they went to college. And that's all part of creating this sort of culture of high expectations. But that, that's an important part of, the, part of it. Uh, wraparound services, you'll see in <clears throat> those five schools that they're working with partners in the community to do more things, better after school program with boys and girls clubs or try to do other things. Uh, <clears throat> supporting the teachers, supporting the leaders, uh, I think that's important. Moreover, on the leaders, we rarely find a school district that's super excelling if they don't have a sort of an activist superintendent. Someone who comes in and really wants to shake things up, working with the teachers, uh, working with researchers, working with the community to say, how do we make sure our kids are successful? Rarely does, <clears throat> when a superintendent comes in and says, I'm just gonna try to keep this boat afloat, you know, you're not gonna see excellence there. And so, uh, and unfortunately, we have a lot of those superintendents in the state of Texas, right? And so it's important that we sort of focus on those leaders that are gonna move things along. And then finally, academic time on task. Um, <clears throat> that's really sort of, for low-income families, this idea of constantly reinforcing academics or something that's academically related with your kids, but moreover, Families are working, so what are the high quality after school programs or before school programs that they're going to? What are the things that we're doing to enrich them during the summer? And as a community, we should be helping those families to make sure that that's happening because that academic time on task is very important. One of the, I watch a little bit of TikTok. Anyone else watch TikTok? Dr. Freedy and I usually are the only people in the room, so I'm very happy to see. Uh, but there's been a whole thing on, on Finland. Uh, it's about a month now. Where fin they were showing all the, the educational excellence in Finland. And Finland, no, nope, they don't do homework. They don't really do academic time on task. They go home early. But it's a super affluent society, right? I mean, every kid going to school is already sort of uh, affluent, right? They're already doing well. And so it's a very different thing, right, when you're talking about kids that are already doing well, uh, and then you sort of do no homework and you have a short school day. When you, when you have families that are low income, where their families, like mine, my parents did not go to college, you need to keep the learning up, right? You need to sort of emphasize it. It's, it's very, very important. And if we go to our Republican legislature, and I know there are a number of Republicans in the room, and, and I have some of, some, some of my former best friends were Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and I could go on and on. This, but I think when, when, you, when you talk to Republican legislators, you know, I think they're focused on uh, just, uh, and, and so you have to sort of convince them uh, we're going in the, in the right direction. Yeah, so we're about to dive into some of our health data, but I just wanted to pause on the wraparound services. Um, we did a pandemic learning loss report a couple of years ago, and one of the things that it really highlighted is how school systems had to step up to address a lot of the community and social needs of children and families during the pandemic. You know, obviously we see that kids not only receive academic um, achievement within a school setting, but they're also receiving health services. That might be the place that they're able to see a school nurse. Um, they have to have immunizations to be in school settings. Um, they have counselors, so hopefully they're having some mental health screenings. Um, there's after school programming, before school programming. So communities that are able to utilize a school setting that has all of these wraparound services are addressing the social determinants of health of those communities and of those families. Um, and so all of this stuff is really interconnected. So I wanted to say one other thing. I, I lost my train of thought there for a minute. Uh, but you'll hear from a lot of people, including Republican legislators, that uh, where are the parents in all of this? Isn't it up to the parents for kids to be successful? And you know, parents are that first line of response. That's very, very important. But the fact of the matter is that when you look at uh, populations of African Americans, populations of Latinos, they see school in a very different way than white, uh, than white parents do. It's not a matter of they're gonna do the same things. It's not a matter of going to the PTA meetings late. And, and moreover, it's, it's not just a matter of schedule. It's a matter of sort of attitude. Like, well, I expect the school district to take care of the kids, you know? So. You hear often, well, schools can't be all things to all kids. 
Well, they're going to have to be if we're going to get them to be successful. They're going to have to be a lot more than they are now, right? And so we're going to have to be doing that because that's where the kids are, and that's where the parents want them to be. Uh, and so we're going to have to do more uh, in that case. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we have to recognize that um, every family situation is different. And in, in families that struggle, they are often working multiple jobs. They can't participate. I mean, even myself, I work what I would consider a reasonably flexible job, but I still can't hop off into school in the middle of the day, right? And I have a lot of privilege. And so we have to recognize the communities that exist and then work around um, the needs that they specifically have and how can we address them and work with the community as opposed to against them. So as we're looking at health uh, data, just a couple of things we wanted to highlight. One was infant mortality rates. Um, our infant mortality rates across the board are kind of going up, um, and so that is concerning. Um, we specifically pulled a map for you all because I think it really highlights a couple of the areas that may be most concerning for San Antonio, um, which we have a really high Hispanic infant mortality rate. The two drivers of infant mortality are primarily preterm birth, so looking at interventions within the maternal health space, um, and then also birth defects. Um, so there's definitely a lot more deeper dive we could do in those areas to see like some birth defects are preventable. Um, most of you all probably know about folic acid. Folic acid is in the grain supply. Um, it has also recently been added to the masa supply. Um, but you have to take folic acid before you even know you're pregnant to be able to prevent spina bifida and other spinal defects. Um, so that's one of the leading birth defects. Um, so we have to look at opportunities to impact infant mortality because we're not even starting life right. And then looking at maternal health, we know that maternal mortality rates are, have been increasing. We just recently, Texas extended uh, Medicaid coverage postpartum for moms to try to address any potential complications they have. So it is now from now up to 12 months postpartum coverage for Medicaid moms, which is wonderful. But there's a lot of good work to be done in this area. And as you can see, there's a lot of disparities that exist within this area as well. Um, some communities are far more impacted by infant mortality. Than others. I think the other thing on this is one is uh, maternal mortality is something that is capturing attention at the legislative level but in many ways our legislature uh, is trying to point this as like this is a black mom's problem right and so we need to make sure we understand we're talking about moms in Texas right we're talking about mothers and we're, we're going to need to do more moreover uh, these two little pullouts here the Hispanic infant mortality rate uh, in these two zip codes at 16 and 11 this is something, right, when you look at zip code data, you start figuring out there's something wrong, right? When, when the Latino uh, infant mortality rate is six uh, for 100,000 kids, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, and then you see in these other areas that it's significantly higher. There's something going on in those communities that we have to investigate to try to figure it out. The other interesting thing is that infant mortality for Latinos being at six, when you look at um, Mexico or the Dominican Republic, the number's around 28, right? So obviously, families that move to the United States, infant mortality goes down dramatically uh, when they move here. But do you see 11 and 16? I mean, there's obviously something over there. So. Yeah, so for that, we really need the context of what's happening in those communities to see what might be contributing to them. Is it an access to care issue? What, where is the challenge? So then when we're looking at other health indicators, um, one is access to care and insurance. Obviously we know how expensive our healthcare system is. Um, San Antonio, interestingly, has higher rates of, um, than the state average of being insured. However, just being insured does not mean better health outcomes. We, um, so we have to be aware of how accessible is that insurance, how expensive is it still to go to the doctor. You maybe have health coverage, but you still can't afford that appointment. The two cities in the developed world with the highest level of uninsurance are Houston and Dallas, right? And so this is in the developed world, the areas that don't have insurance. San Antonio is sort of breaking that curve, right? They're doing a little bit better in this area. But this is a Texas problem as well, that why aren't we taking care of our insured kids? We're one of only 10 states that uh, haven't adopted Medicaid, right? So. Uh, and the governor is not moving on this. Uh, we've tried all sorts of little workarounds in terms of calling it, don't call it Medicaid, we'll call it, you know, t Health for Texans and like, no. Uh, we've tricked them before, but not moving. <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, so it's something that we need to be aware of. And there are a lot of red states that have voted, right? Heavy Republican states that have voted, no, we want Medicaid expansion. Right after Uvalde, I remember watching the press conference with the governor there in Uvalde, and he said, obviously this is a mental health problem, and um, I don't think it's obvious, but, but it's a 
that it's it's that's the talking point. And we said, well, are we going to get more money for med for uh, mental health? And he said, absolutely. And then some reporter, some smart reporter, said, well, do you, would you consider Medicaid expansion because that would bring in 200 million into the state just for mental health? And he said, no, we'll find the money a different way. Well, he did find the money a different way. Uh, but this is an idea of what would happen if we had Medicaid expansion. Yeah. Um, I'm, we're going way too long. No, you're great. You're okay. actually, I think okay. we're fine. Uh, but I did want to call out immunization. So one of the things that happened to the legislature this past session is there was a bill that was removing um, school and child care vaccine mandates. Um, so that would mean that right now we do have a very generous exemption policy in the state of Texas. You can be exempted from vaccinations, right? So you're not required to go, you just have to have the exemption paperwork filed to be able to attend school. Um, this was removing it completely. So one of the things that's interesting, dynamic that happens when you're looking at immunizations here in Texas um, and a lot of other communities is that you know families are busy. Low-income families struggle. Uh, they, they have to take time off of work. They might have transportation issues to get to immunization clinics, et cetera, et cetera. And so sometimes they get behind on immunization schedules. Not out of any malicious intent or not out of a desire to not keep their kid healthy, just because life is hard and they're just doing the best they can, right? And so a requirement for school entry kind of means like, oh, I gotta do this, and so I will figure it out because my kid needs to go to school and I need to get these vaccines done. And so there's vaccine clinics and communities that they're able to access. Um, but what we're seeing across the board is this, this downward trend of kids being immunized. And what that means for us is that there's all of these preventable diseases that we have because we have herd immunity that are now being impacted, right? So it's impacting our school workforce, it's impacting our children's health, family health, ability to go to work because of measles, et cetera. Um, and so what you'll see is here nationally, we're sitting around 70, um, a little bit lower for Texas, and then even lower for Bayer County. So kids are not getting immunized with the basic seven immunization series. This doesn't include things like meningitis or uh, chicken pox, just the basics that we think of as childhood um, immunizations. And so that's important because what we're doing is we're putting our children in our community at risk for preventable diseases. And we are seeing things like polio, measles pop back up. Um, and so it's something that we have to kind of keep in consideration when we're talking with our, with our clients that being immunized, immunized ensures that their children can be healthy. Um, and we are seeing that slowly. One of my buddies who lives a couple uh, houses down from me is Peter Hotez. Some of you may have seen Peter Hotez on MSNBC. And, uh, CNN. He used to be on Fox, but they kicked him off. And uh, he would. He talks about. He's an infectious disease guy, and he talks about this. And I remember uh, we sometimes see each other when we're walking in the morning. And he said, "Bob, you know, I'm really excited that one of the side benefits that may come from COVID is that people like vaccines more." And this is very early on, you know, because he, they were working hard to develop the vaccine. His vaccine is the one that they're using in India. And so uh, he was very excited about this, but the opposite has happened, right? It's now people are much more wary of vaccinations. And so many people are skipping COVID vaccinations and they're skipping measles vaccinations and other things that are gonna be dangerous. And I, you talk to enough uh, pediatricians and you realize most of them want all the vaccines, but they all even say, you know, if people don't wanna do the COVID vaccine, that's fine, but do the other ones at least, right? But we're finding a lot of families that are not doing the other vaccines. Yeah, and thankfully that bill did not pass, in case there was any concern in the audience. That bill did not pass, but we did see a number of immunization bills that were put forward, including removing um, the power from DSHS, our public health entity in Texas, um, so that the legislature could decide. So those are things that we kind of have to keep an eye on as we're thinking about how our communities are impacted by policy. So one of the other points that we wanted to kind of talk about was a little bit more about diabetes and obesity here in this community. Yeah, uh, very quickly on this is that uh, this is a Latino health, this is a, an American health problem, but it's become accentuated in the Latino community. Uh, and we see it in the Valley, we see it in San Antonio, we see it in El Paso. Uh, these are, this is an issue that is a key issue for our kids. And we're gonna have to find and figure out some comprehensive way uh, that we can intervene uh, on Latino uh, obesity, childhood obesity. It's, and frankly, it's important for all of our kids, but we see so much of it, especially the type two diabetes coming out of Latino kids, out of the Latino communities. Uh, it's, it's such a negative impact. And we'll be talking a little bit more about that here in a minute in the panel. 
So we're going to move over to mental health, but real quick, Dr. Bob, I want to be thoughtful about time. So um, if you all do have any questions on your program, there's a QR code where you can submit them so we can walk through them if you need to. <clears throat> we want to make sure that we're able to answer questions and anything that is not covered today, we certainly are happy to follow up with you. So in terms of mental health, Dr. Yeah, Dr. Bob, take so it away. So here's the big thing. So mental health, uh, when we look at Texas as a whole, uh, Texas ranks, uh, today as we speak, 50th out of 51 states, if you include D.C. as sort of an area, uh, in terms of mental health access. And so we're not doing the things necessary. We were 49th, and then we had a big a big bunch of money was spent on mental health, and we went to 50th, and, which is right. So that means everyone else is spending as well, but not, but we're not, right? Uh, and so uh, it can be, you know, one of the easiest ways to look at this is if you look at counselors in the schools, right? So that first line of defense. And we, have, well, we can say a lot about counselors in the schools, but uh, 503 students in the San Antonio area for every school counselor. The national recommended ratio is 250 to 1. And this doesn't even include the fact that our schools are so overburdened that a lot of those counselors aren't really doing counseling, right? And so when we think about things that really help, we think about some of the programs that come into the schools, like communities and schools, that do a really nice job of focusing on mental health. Mental Health America does it focuses on mental health. And so it's one of the things that we're gonna to have to do a lot more in our state. We're still not serious about it. And one of the things, I mentioned this earlier, whenever there's a shooting, right, we wanna put more money into mental health. There's not really a necessary tie there, but if mental health advocates, like, we'll take what we can get, right? We'll take, yeah, so if you wanna say it's, it's because of that, we'll take that money. But it's like a little lie that we're living with to make it acceptable to, re to receive more mental health money. But there needs to be a lot more mental health money coming along. Yeah, and what, this also really calls attention to access to care, access to mental health services. One, if you do have private insurance, how expensive it is still to go to mental health. If you can find somebody, child therapists or child mental health professionals, even harder to find an adult. Um, and then you have to be able to have the time and the resources to be able to get to those appointments often during the eight to five working hours as well, right? So when we're looking at the complexities of what families are having to experience to be, even be able to access these services, it can be overwhelming for families that are already struggling and are underwater. And, and briefly on the suicide ideation, uh, there aren't state, there's not state data on some of this, but nationally, when you look at Latino students, suicide ideation, it's higher than this. Uh, so there, this is a, a real problem amongst uh, Latino, Latina teenagers. So the data tells us what the data tells us, but data is just numbers, right? It doesn't necessarily provide all the context for the experience of the families in our communities. That's why we're excited to have our panelists. But we did want to kind of highlight some of the three areas of need that we're seeing, as well as the areas of resilience that we have in this community, because resilience means there's strength, and there's so much strength in San Antonio. And so how can we leverage that strength and those opportunities to be able to help impact those problems? So all across the board, when we think of some of the sort of key areas, uh, childhood obesity, diabetes, we've talked a little bit about that. That is a key area in San Antonio. It's a key area in Texas. All of these will be key areas in Texas, but they're also key Latino issues and key San Antonio issues. Uh, gaps in mental health support, which we've talked about, and then kindergarten readiness. How do we make sure that those kids are going to get into uh, the K-12 system and be able to, to succeed? And then underlying all of that, it's access to support services, making sure that we're using the federal dollars that are there for us to make sure that we could uh, we can help kids and families, and then figuring out systematic and social factors. And I would even say another one might be sort of the built environment. What is the built environment going on in San Antonio, and how can that have an impact on mental health, on obesity, uh, some of these things? We haven't. I mean, as we've gone through this, we've whisked through this data. There's so many other sort of key issues that are so important. Uh, but um, I think we've done a good overview, Kim, because of you. <laughs> Thank you, Lucy. All right, so when we're looking at areas of resilience, what we see is definitely early childhood intervention programs, ECI programs, is definitely an area of resilience for San Antonio. Um, this is timely intervention in the early years of life that can impact both the success of the child but also the success of the family. I think the other part of early childhood is that San Antonio is really the first community in the state to recognize the importance of that early childhood experience, whether that be pre-K or child care, right? So the idea is you know, like double, triple down on that because that's going to be real important. Uh, preservation of the culture. You see, we see in San Antonio this uh, increase in the enrollment of dual language programs. Uh, what we all understand is that dual language programs are better than any single language program. 
Uh, and so more of that is, is going to be an important thing. Uh, San Antonio uh, is sort of have, you know, I, I love San Antonio because of sort of the civic pride. Uh, and, and we, uh, people who speak Spanish, of course, make fun of San Antonio because no one speaks Spanish in San Antonio, even though everyone's Latino. And so um, no one laughed because no one laughs in San Antonio likes to be made fun of. <laughs> so, um, but I think that this idea of uh, preservation of culture is super, super important. Yeah, and then SNAP services. We have a higher share of families receiving SNAP benefits, which is wonderful, right? Because we're talking about these are federal programs that are available to families, sometimes very difficult to access, as anyone who's worked in direct case management or service implementation realizes how challenging those barriers are. Um, but that we do have a higher number of families receiving that, which is great, because then we're talking about addressing some of the food insecurity that we have. So how can we continue to leverage that? Um, learn those lessons of what's working in those communities to be able to get people enrolled so that we can continue to push up those numbers. So when we're looking at our path forward, right, again, the data is the data, and what we wanted to do is kind of set the foundation so we kind of knew some of the bullets that we're talking about, but what's most really important is that how can we engage and collaborate as partners, both at the state and the local level, to ensure that we're changing multiple layers of intervention? We're talking about direct service entities. Probably a lot of you all who are actually providing services to families. What's the experience that you are having and that those families are having that we can learn from? And then how can organizations like ourselves look to change policies to make your job easier and to ensure that those families have the support services that they need, right? We need to be able to do both. We have to help the individual while also trying to improve the system. So we need to collaborate. We also need to look at it from different perspectives. So one of the things that has been a really big shift even within my own, my own career is the importance of lived experience, right? So, you know, someone like myself, I started in direct service. I started in uh, working with homeless families and families who were experiencing interpersonal violence. But that was a long time ago and things have changed. And so now that I'm working in a more administrative capacity, how can I learn and listen to the stories of those in the community so that we can understand what are the challenges they're experiencing, the barriers, and then how can we lift up those voices in a way that is equitable, that is heard, so that policymakers, people who are change makers can hear it, and we can actually improve the system and services that we're experiencing. And that's the discussion we want to have today. Absolutely, and, and I'll say one little thing about collaboration. Uh, I teach a graduate level class on philanthropy, and just the other day we had a group of philanthropists, and they were talking about collaboration, and that they saw the data that when nonprofits collaborate, you know, the results are so much better, right? And where they're not sort of fighting over turf. Uh, but they've also discovered that a lot of times there are a lot of uh, foundations that will say, you have to collaborate. And they said there's no, there's no bigger failure than when you tell someone that they have to collaborate. And so it's up to us really to want to have to collaborate in the nonprofit community, right? We have to want to collaborate. Uh, and, and you know, I find, we find at Children at Risk that a lot of young staff sort of don't get that yet. They find that it's easier probably just to do it on your own. It's just so much easier. So you have to be much more intentional about sort of training and teaching uh, how to be collaborative. So before we move over to our wonderful panelists, we wanted to just see if there was any questions. I'm going to turn it over to Mary Gar, who's going to... Um, you have some good questions, Mary? I think so. What's the best one? <laughs> so, oh, there's two good questions here. So the first one is, given the current political climate, what kinds of policies are most likely to pass that can help address the needs and challenges highlighted in today's conference? Yeah, so two things. And then I may need you to repeat it when I get to the second thing. I won't. <laughs> but the first thing is that the best thing to change public policy is to vote. Yeah. In this state of Texas, there are two groups that don't vote, young people and Latinos. And so when you look at that bigger group, you have to wonder what is happening. Because if young people and Latino or either one of those voted in numbers, everything would change in Texas and we would not have to worry about some of these policies. That being said, I go to a lot of national conferences with friends from blue states, and one of the things that they say is that we still have to fight because kids don't vote. And so for children's policy, it's still very tough. Uh, so voting will change a lot, and a lot of things we worry about will be assuaged, but I think that uh, it's something that we have to stay engaged in. And then this other, other policy that... Hey, we just said, what kinds of policies are most likely to pass that can help address okay. the needs and challenges? Yeah, and the other thing is that 
there are a lot of knee-jerk reactions in our state legislature. So if you talk about sex education, if you talk about gun control, uh, there are things that they, you just can't get anywhere, right, when you talk about those things. So we tend to just, okay, we'll move on, because there are other groups that are doing some of that stuff and we're happy to support them. But there are so many issues, so many little issues, that you can really have a big impact on because Republicans and Democrats all like kids, they all like families, and so sometimes it's just how you frame it. And so early education is one of our best examples. We're going to town on that because that's something that both, both parties can get behind and can do stuff. And there's a lot of things. Child safety, we do a horrible job with foster care kids in this state and creating a safety net, so we can slowly start chipping away at some of those things. So we don't like to spend money on victims in the state of Texas, uh, and so anytime we can be proactive and talk about what, how we can prevent victims, it's, it's a really good thing. I'm not saying what's, that all of this is sort of the, the right thing, but it's the thing that works many times. Okay, one other question. And the uh, second final question right now is, so with the number of schools that are closing in San Antonio, classroom sizes potentially increasing, kids <coughs> having to travel to get to school, etc. How do you suggest that we move forward or continue to support those families? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that's happening in San Antonio is you've had an influx of these charter schools that, that aren't what you've seen traditionally in Texas, right? The, traditionally in Texas, a lot of the charter schools have served low-income families, but you have moving into San Antonio these charter schools that are going after the, the middle-income and the, the higher-income families, and, and and that, that's taking away a lot of peer learning in those schools. And so it's almost like you have to be thinking outside of the system. How do you compete with those schools? And is it a creation of more magnet schools and gifted and talented schools? And what we see that cities have competed with that, it's, it's that they actually compete. You know, uh, at some level we have, to say, we have to realize this is the political reality. How are we going to compete? Because these families, right? Uh, they're going to go wherever they think is best for their kids, and our schools have to figure out what works. The good news is that there are good examples, right? There are good examples around the state of what works, and so we have to continue to go after that. It's not easy, though, and, and when you're losing those middle-income kids, that's super hard, right? That's very hard on the district. If the panelists, I know, want to start moving up, there is one good question I think that would be helpful. Yeah, panelists, come on too. up. So, so. Um, another question that was asked is, for those families who are eligible for benefits but aren't claiming them, why aren't they claiming them? And I'll add to that question, what can we do to help encourage them to do so? And how can we yeah, them? a lot of that is, um, I mean, there are probably people that could, uh, that could, can, uh, there are probably a lot of people that could answer that question better than I could, and uh, but I think, uh, uh, Dr. Trevino, why would you what would you say about that? I mean, in terms of why aren't families claiming their benefits, Latino families? There's a lot of pride in the Latino family, and uh, even though they're poor, they would rather just you know stick it out. <coughs> Sorry. There's a lot of pride in the Hispanic community, uh, and uh, you know we, we don't want to say that we're on welfare or that we take food stamps. That that would that is embarrassing. So they'd rather tie up the, make a knot, and um, and move forward without those. Yeah. And, and another piece is we also have mixed families, some documented, some undocumented, exactly. and some of them are afraid it will affect their status if they try to claim. And then it's also further than adversely affecting the whole family that way. So I wanted to just, I just want to go back to the education one because I wanted to say that you're not like. San Antonio is not unique in what's happening in the public school system. Um, there are schools that are closing in throughout the entirety of the state. I think what we're we've seen is the this social conscious shift from public school support to more privatized school. We certainly have had a big battle at the legislature on school vouchers this last session. So it's not unique, but it is a new a new problem, right? Where public school su settings have been something that's just been standard. It's an entitlement. Every child is required to be served. But what happens is when school students move to another school, that funding follows them. And so now we are having schools that are not have never received enough funding to be able to support the amount of work that they do, and now they are receiving even less funding. And so one of the things, the solutions for us is not a solution to the problem yet, but is a, a need for conversation amongst all of us, because it is new for all of us to try to address it. It is a new uh, 
a new thing that's happening in the state and we need to figure out how we're all going to work together when we find a solution that's potentially working in a community how can we duplicate that across the state so we're not alone in that it's not a problem that we can figure out yet but we are going to figure it out very good uh, and now if you guys have your microphones right next to you just so that you uh, so that you could use those uh, when I ask you a question but I thought we'd start and, and obviously they're not in the same order up here down here but uh, um, oh, yeah, they're not. Yeah. But uh, I thought this would be, this is your chance to answer a brief question. Deb, I'll start with you. Uh, introduce yourself and sort of what are you bringing to this conversation in brief? Good morning. I'm Deborah Zuluaga from El Paso, Texas, and I am the recently retired president and CEO of the United Way in El Paso um, and have stepped down just on January 31st and will be moving to a new position at our community foundation next Friday. Um, and before I uh, talk about anything else, I do want to thank Children at Risk and Family Service for this amazing opportunity. And I will tell you, uh, I just listening to it just fires me up to really um, be a part of solutions. And I'm so excited to be here in San Antonio to really have an opportunity with you. Also, thanks to Mary Gard, to Kim Parker, and of course, to the great leader from Children at Risk, Dr. Bob Sanborn. So thank you all so much for hosting this and bringing us all together. It's just amazing. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't really, to answer your question, what do you bring to this? I have no idea. Yeah, yeah. Um, I am going to do my best to kind of share with you some, uh, kind of some, and it's interesting because obviously um, we are in far west Texas, so geographically very isolated from Austin, San Antonio, Houston, this big mega that we think of in West Texas. Um, we also are politically a little different than some of the areas around where you all are. So we're, but we see many of the same things, um, and we see so much of what we, what I'm hearing today about San Antonio. It's just a mirror of El Paso, just in a little smaller scale. Um, and I think there's some things that we are doing in El Paso that. I know you all are doing here, and sometimes it's just a reminder of what you're doing is the right thing. What I will say is, is that I think one of the things that, that every community needs to do is to take what is being done and take those best practices and take those great ideas and concepts and, and make, we call them, a pass wise them. You know, you need to make them for San Antonio, you need to make them for your own communities, whether you're coming from other parts of the state. And that is just to recognize that there's so much good work going out there um, but you need to make it unique to your community and make it work for your community. And I, I, the other thing I would just finally like to say is um, I think there is this sense, we talked about collaboration and I agree, but I think one of the things that I think we really need to do as a community is to recognize um, collaboration is more than referrals. And how do we do that? And um, you know, and I think that's the big thing is, you know, I think we go, funders do that all the time. You know, well, we want you to collaborate. Oh, I do, I, I refer. That's not collaboration. So I think that's one of the big things that we need to find a way to make, to your point, Dr. Bob, make it not about, you know, again, we're all fighting for the same dollars and how do we do that? And so I think that's, you know, one of the things that I think we need to have more conversations about so that I potentially could could be and I and again I will also say if I say something about this I'm a good still, brief I'm intro. A, no thanks. Good. Yes, right. <laughs> you know me. <laughs> so thank you very much. So I'll let you. I'll give it back to you. And, and one of the great things about um, you know we have staff in El Paso. We love going out to El Paso and. I love San Antonio because of all the civic pride, right? There's more civic pride in San Antonio than anywhere in North Texas than in Houston. The only place that I feel this, that has maybe more civic pride, El Paso, right? I mean, it's sort of it's an interesting, uh, interesting deal. So that's one of the reasons why we have you here too. So. Uh, Trish, uh, out of Victoria, Texas. So right. talk a little bit about what you're doing, uh, about yourself and what you're doing, Trish. Well, I'm the executive director of Christ's Kitchen. We're a 501c3 soup kitchen that serves one hot meal a day without judgment to the homeless and underserved of our community. More than that, we use food to develop relationships with our community to better know how to meet those needs that they have. So talking about collaboration, I think we're making inroads there, but it's very difficult to get other nonprofits to lose that Lone Ranger attitude mm -hmm. and be willing to collaborate. But we're working on it and we're not going to give up. Mm -hmm. 
So we feed a lot of people. Um, we feed a lot of people. <laughs> and, and I will want to get into homelessness in, in a little bit as well because uh, first off, people are always amazed when they know there's when they find out there's homelessness in Victoria, Texas, Absolutely. right? Yeah. I mean, they get we it in, in, in San Antonio, they get it in Houston, but to, to hear that there's problems, so I want to get into that a little bit as well. So thank, thank you, thank you, Trish. Uh, Dr. Jamie Freeney is with us. Uh, Dr. Freeney is one of the big experts across the state on mental health. And so, Dr. Freeney, uh, my TikTok friend, so... Uh, <laughs> Thanks. You always find a way to call us out. <laughs> um, so, good morning, everyone. I'm Jamie. I serve as the director of the Center for School Behavioral Health at Mental Health America of Greater Houston. Mental Health America of Greater Houston is a local affiliate of the National Mental Health America. So, our mission is um, providing access to mental health services for all, and in my department, I get to focus on the children and the teens. We primarily use schools as a vehicle for education, and we are a convener. We have a collaborative that um, I like to say sits at the intersection of education and mental health, um, where we're trying to bridge um, access and um, those community partnerships um, to increase the supports that are offered to children and to prevent um, future mental illness among um, children today. So thanks so much for having me. Thank you, Dr. Freeney. Dr. Trevino, so we're, you know, so we're, we're El Paso, Victoria, Houston, and now we're back in uh, uh, the big city here. So talk a little bit about what you're doing, Dr. Trevino, because it's very much related to some of the stuff we talked about. Yep. My name is Roberto Trevino Peña, and I'm from San Antonio. And I grew up in a very exclusive neighborhood where you needed to have an income below poverty level. <laughs> and, and that's the Victoria Porch. It was a housing project along Cesar Chavez. Um, you know, I went on to medical school and uh, did a residency in internal medicine and then did a fellowship. And these are all in Chicago Medical School, the fellowship in critical care medicine. So I came back and uh, ran the intensive care units of three major hospitals in San Antonio. And then I ended up opening up uh, six clinics, primary care in the poorest neighborhoods of San Antonio. After all this training, all this education, and all this professional life, I realized that the medical model is not the solution. It's public health, it's neighborhood, it's outreach, community is where the solution is at. And uh, now, uh, what was the, one more? <laughs> That's pretty good. Okay. <laughs> Uh, did you have a COVID during the, because you know, I felt like I have COVID and in my memory, I must have long COVID. I, I don't think it has anything to do with age. I'm just thinking it's COVID. So. Yeah. Right, thanks for laughing at my joke. Uh, Alan Watkins is with us uh, from Houston. And what Alan does is very interesting. But we did talk a lot about housing, uh, but having a place to live is sort of a key ingredient to that sort of long-term success. Alan? Um, I didn't know you were this funny. <laughs> um, uh, Alan Watkins with uh, the Houston Housing Collaborative. I serve as the executive director. Uh, have been there um, for the last three years, 2024, February, uh, going into my uh, fourth year. Uh, and um, the, the organization has been around since 2016. Uh, and it's interesting to hear that some of the, th uh, the themes that you all have been talking about uh, is related to collaboration. Uh, and that is one of the things that, that, that we strive and aim to do uh, in the housing space uh, in, in, in Houston. Um, it's, also, it's also good to know, and so, so thank you all for inviting me, uh, because one of the things that, that we, as the Housing Collaborative in Houston uh, does, is we also connect with and try to do our best um, to, to do work in the social determinants of health related to housing. And in that space, there's also collaboration that we do in Houston as well. Uh, we collaborate with two organizations. Uh, one is, uh, uh, well, first of all, the Houston Housing Collaborative is a membership-wide organization in the greater Houston area. And so we collaborate with another uh, membership-wide organization in the health space it's called the Health Equity Collective, uh, and, uh, and uh, we also partner with the Kinder Institute of Urban Research, uh, which is connected to uh, Rice University. Uh, and so between the three of us, uh, we all know our distinctive roles 
uh, collaboration is key. And in order for us to do our work and strive, obviously, Kinder does the research part of it, uh, but, uh, but after the research, what is there? What is the, what is the impact uh, socially? Uh, what is the impact uh, to, our, to our communities? And that's what uh, the Health Equity Collective is trying to do medically uh, in the health space, and that's what the Housing Collaborative is trying to do in the housing space. And the, and the ultimate goal is to be able to move the needle after the research is done, to be able to move the needle at a policy level um, so that we can bring uh, health equity uh, to our residents in the greater Houston area. Very good, thank you very much, Ellen. What, what I wanna do is ask a sort of a first line of questions, maybe a little bit of follow up, but I would love to have more time for your questions. And so if you could still use that little QR code and send stuff to Mary, we'll try to get to questions. We have about an hour left in the, the conference to be able to do this. Alan, can I start with you? I, I wonder, uh, we did talk about housing in San Antonio, uh, but a lot of there's a per national perception that housing costs uh, in San Antonio, in Houston, in Texas are a little bit, it's cheaper. But when you're one of those families that's below the federal poverty line, uh, when you're one of those families where your kids are getting free in school lunch, uh, what are some of the options for you in terms of housing and, and uh, what should a community be building towards? Did you tee that up for me? Because uh, that was a great softball question. I appreciate that. Um, but, but, but here's the answer. Um, let me start with a, just some, some quick data points. Uh, in the Houston area, uh, the, the average, the median price of housing uh, uh, sale is about $345,000. Now, what in the world can a low-income family do uh, at, at that price level? Um, the other data I want to bring to you is, is a study uh, that, that is in the Houston area. Harris County did it a couple, three years ago. It's called My Home is Here. Uh, and that is a study uh, just kind of analyzing and assessing uh, what, are the, what are the housing costs and potential needs uh, for housing across all, all income areas in the Harris County in Houston. It's called My Home is Here. And if you Google it, uh, I promise you, you'll, you'll find it. Uh, but the point is, is that in that study, they say that 150,000 units are needed for, uh, for, the income, for the income range of $20,000 $20, and below. 150, over the next 10 years, $20,000, um, we need 150,000 units over the next 10 years. That, that's a lot. And if you consider Houston, and that's just for current residents, but if you also consider the influx of folks that are coming in Houston, uh, it, is, it is astounding. I wouldn't be surprised if that number is higher. So what are the solutions? What can we do? Well, um, in, the collab in the housing collaborative space, we partner again uh, with uh, what is called uh, the Houston Land Bank. We also partner again with, a, with an organization called uh, the Houston Community Land Trust. Now, there may be some, um, there may be some uh, uh, pros and cons uh, about is the Community Land Trust important? Is it a useful tool? Absolutely, it's a, it's a useful tool. Um, it's a way for low-income families to purchase a house uh, and, and to afford it and to be able to live there at an affordable rate long term. Now, there's some cons to that. And the con is, is that if they decide to sell it, they won't be able to sell it necessarily at a, at a, at a regular market rate because the, the, their profit is capped in order to keep that house affordable. Um, so, so there's some pros and cons. Some people like it, some people don't but it is a useful tool. Another option is, is, is for government subsidies, for government to continue to subsidize the build of low-income houses. And that, and, and that is, a, is a fantastic opportunity for us as the collaborative to continue to push, control, persuade our elected officials uh, to bring more government subsidies in whatever capacity to lower the price of housing so that folks can, can, can afford it. Now, it is, it is a challenge to do that, but it's helpful for the community and it's also helpful for the banks because the banks as a business need want to be able to lower their risk and one of the ways that they can lower their risk is by government subsidy to help, to help with that. Thank you very much, Alan. 
Roberto, I want to ask you, you know, we talked about childhood obesity in the, in the presentation. Uh, this is a problem across our state. It's a big problem in the Valley. It's a huge problem in San Antonio. Uh, it's going to take a lot of things to happen. It's not just one little solution. Talk about some of the things that you guys <coughs> are doing at Vienstein and Lima, uh, and talk a little bit about what we need to be doing as a community around childhood obesity, type 2 diabetes. Well, I think uh, if you want to address, um, you know, the metabolic disease in, in children, which is, again, diabetes, obesity, hyperinsulinemia, hyperlipidemia, um, you know, we need to understand what is the cause of this problem. And many times we think that it's a, it's a, it's a genetic problem, that these children were born with a gene and are developing the disease. Well, let me tell you, they have not found the gene. There's no genetic cause for this. You know who the problem is? I'm not saying what, who is all of us in here. It's the social environment that's caused, that's programming developmentally this metabolic disease in children. What do I mean by social environment? Well, uh, schools, last week on the newspaper, it announced that one of the school districts was cutting physical education for children, you know, older grades. Um, two months ago, I was at a school board meeting um, speaking against cutting funding for mental health. And the other part is neighborhoods. If you go uh, five blocks uh, south, you see a street, Guadalupe Street. And if you go five miles on that street, it's among the poorest neighborhoods in the state, you see only one recreational park, Olga Madrid YWCA. If you go from downtown on Broadway to Alamo Heights, which is one of the most affluent, you see five recreational parks. Neighborhood has a lot to do with it. Mass media. I'm sure everybody here saw the Super Bowl. What was the commercials? Fat, sugar, and beer. And and so all this mess. You're talking my diet. <laughs> <laughs> You know, all this messaging and, and corporate conduct also. You know, what was the most talked about uh, commercial? Duncan. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, the last one is government. You know, all these politicians on both sides. You know, they go and pass these bills. They get a lot of prestige. Their name is on the bill for, you know, health education, for children's health, for children. And they're unfunded. Un so all the, the only person that wins is the politician, they get prestige, but the children, there's no change. So if the social environment is the problem, the intervention needs to be based on ecological theory, meaning that we need to develop structured curriculums for the four environments that have the most influence in children's health. And what are those four environments? Health class. Um, there's, right now, some school districts have health books from 20 years ago. The state doesn't fund it. Maybe 0.0001% for health education. Physical education, also structured curriculum for PE. Um, the third one is school food service, a structured curriculum for school food service. Children are eating two meals in the school cafeteria, so they need to be part of that environment. And then the last one, and, and most important, is parents, the structured curriculum for parents. So that is the four components of the blood <coughs> problem. And so those are what we address. Uh, I wonder, one of the pieces of data that I didn't talk about is that nationally, when you look at childhood obesity amongst Latino populations, Latino children, uh, the, the group least likely to engage in team sports, Latino children. Uh, and there are a couple other things like that that I feel like with intentionality, right, if communities understood, you know, so is there a way to be much more intentional when we talk about this issue? Yeah. Again, um, you know, we do talk about obesity and black and Latinos and obesity and black and Latinos, and, um, but you know who has the highest rates of obesity? It's Appalachian whites. It's, it's not black and Latinos. So what is going on here? So again, you know, the color of the skin or the genetic admixture has nothing to do with this high rates of all the social problem. Poverty, it is poverty, again, poverty. So, so that's the major problem. So again, when you're in poverty, um, you know, there, you, 
the mother does not have a suburban to take their kids to soccer ball and and all these you know all these uh, team uh, you know uh, you know games. So so a lot has to do poverty and and poverty is also something that needs to be addressed. Absolutely. Very good. Dr. Freeney, we, mental health is a big conversation across the state, right? It's not as big a conversation at the state legislature as we would like it to be. But how do we change that conversation? What do, what do Texans, voting Texans, and legislators need to know about mental health, especially as it relates to kids uh, that they don't know right now? Well, I'm not sure what they don't know right now um, because they're pretending to not know, know a lot. Yes, yes. Um, and not to connect the dots, such as mentally healthy, mentally well children perform well academically, and they graduate, they go on to college. Um, so I, I say a couple of things. One is really, I guess because I've been a child advocate and interested in children's mental health for a very long time, I'm realizing that that wasn't the case at Everybody wasn't necessarily focused on that, and so children's mental health in the conversations is just something that's been happening in the last decade or two. So as we continue to learn more, I think the um, important components are access and um, screening. Access to not only services, but to all of the kinds of supports that contribute to mental wellness. You don't necessarily need access to a psychiatrist for every child. Um, but you would need access to a peer mentor or a counselor in times of crisis or when those children are experiencing mental illness and may not um, have the, um, may not be able to articulate what's wrong or they don't have the words, but um, a nurse or a counselor can say, okay, you've had a stomach ache for five, stomach ache for five days in a row during math class. I, I don't think it's a virus. Let's look at maybe anxiety maybe depression. So I think because we're starting to have those conversations, we're actually expanding our breadth of knowledge as far as what it looks like for a child to experience mental illness or stress. Um, and then when we talk about access, again, yes, we want to, we want families to be able to access quality health care, quality services, mental health services, but it's very difficult because the medical model or how we have looked at medicine is we've separated physical health from mental health. And so now as we're moving forward, we're starting to hear more about the integration of mental health services, behavioral health services within the primary care clinic, within the hospital systems. And so I think we should definitely continue to go that way, but also think about, okay, where are kids majority of the time during their lives? They're at school. So if we can start to co-locate services then we may have an increased um, increased access and we might have mentally healthier children because parents don't have to take off work um, and you can take care of all of that on one, on, on one campus. The important component, and this is what the legislature did when I testified on behalf of a bill, they restated what I said, but they said, oh, so you're saying we need to hire teacher, we need to hire counselors instead of teachers. Yeah. No, no, no. No, 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 no. We need to hire counselors and teachers. And so while schools, the priority is that academic achievement, no one is trying to change that. But we, what we are trying to do is recognize that, hey, while you have, your, these children are with you majority of their childhood, then let's take this opportunity to also help them grow and develop mentally and physically while they're here on this campus. So that, and then I think two or three is the contributing factors have changed a lot since we were young. I mean, yeah, we're on TikTok, but we know, well, at least I do, when we get it off at like 3 a.m. But um, some kids, you know, some children are like scroll and scroll and scroll it, and they're, they are um, digesting this information and personalizing it. Well, what, what, what I'm proposing is to, especially for older children, to start to teach them, what do what does a, a credible website, if you're gonna go look up depression, if you're gonna go look up anxiety, what do credible websites look like? And just because you might see someone or hear something on, on social media that you resonate with, before you truly identify with them, stop. 
So in the legislature, it's going back to talking about, okay, now we have social media, we have internet safety, we've talked about abuse, we've talked about trafficking, but how can we now protect our young people from the um, stressors that come from predatory um, issues when, when they're online, as well as some of the, the impacts of social and we, media. And we don't want social media to be the boogeyman, right? I mean, a lot oh, of people no. like to make it the scapegoat. This is the reason we have mental health. It's one of the reasons, but it's not yeah. the reason. It's a, there's a pro and a con, and again, I think it's about teaching young people so that they have the autonomy and they have the knowledge to, to know when to cut it off, when to draw boundaries. Those types of it's things. It's like blaming the Beatles for our cultural demise, right? It's sort of the same sort of thing, right? I mean, it's just. Uh, Trish, you were going to ask something or comment on something? We're, we're blaming hip hop. <laughs> idea. That is uh, an aha moment for me because it takes three to six months to get into our local mental health authority. Uh, yeah, we'll do intakes all day long, Monday through Friday, eight to three. But we don't have a psychiatrist on staff anymore. They see a nurse prac by Zoom. But if we could co-locate mental health in our school system, phenomenal. I love that. It's 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 a model that we're um, we're hoping to push toward. Of course, there's there's the need for funding, but we are going in that direction with the. Um, CPAN and TCHAT, which TCHAT, if you're not familiar, it's the Texas, um, it's the Technology Children's Health Access um, Network where they can get free services through a school that connects with TCHAT. Um, I can make sure you're, you're connected there. And then CPAN, which is really great for rural communities where there aren't psychiatrists and psychologists, and that is like a network of behavioral health providers who consult with one another. One may be in Houston, another one may be in El Paso, and they can consult and still bring the services to those children even though they're not on site. Jamie, I wanted to ask you a uh, follow-up. In terms of counselors in the schools, uh, sometimes legislators see that they're still not putting more counselors in the schools or more money towards that, but is, is, that, is that the biggest answer amongst many, or is it just one of many big answers? I. Personally, I think it's one of many big answers. The research tells us that if we, um, the schools that have a counselor, a school nurse, a social worker, the students tend to do better because they can have the case management services and all those things aren't falling onto one person. But I do think continuing to train our teachers um, in what and how to recognize those signs and symptoms, then we can start to navigate away from penalizing students who are um, just behaving in a way that is really a cry for help. And we send them to DADP, we send them to the juvenile justice system, we send them to DFPS, and oftentimes about 70% of those children who go into those systems, that's the first time they've had a mental health screening. Mm -hmm. And that's too late, obviously it's too late. So what we are trying to do is help to um, rethink uh, discipline policies and rethink what, it, what we're doing when we are, are taking a child who's merely laying their head down or their hood is over their, their, their head, we send them out of the classroom and then on to, to suspend them for two and three days, you're not, you're not helping their mental wellness. And now you're taking away their learning and then you're gonna blame them for not achieving high. So I think there's some restructuring to do as well when we are thinking about um, how to best support um, those young people. Thank you, Dr. Freeman. Uh, Trish, uh, day in and day out, you're working with uh, uh, homeless people and homeless families. When you think about homeless families and homeless children in Victoria, what's the lesson that you're learning about those from those kids and from those families that sort of needs to be addressed? One of my colleagues always says, no one wakes up in the morning wanting to be homeless. Um, mm. If we had adequate housing, three to five year wait for, uh, sorry, yeah, three to five year wait for most of our housing in Victoria. We don't have affordable housing, okay? So when you're evicted, you're gonna live in your car or on my property. Um, mm. I'll address the obesity issue, but mental health care. Majority of our homeless community 
struggles with mental health care issues and drug addiction. We don't have an inpatient treatment facility. Um, and when mommy and daddy aren't well and can't pay the rent, where, where do they go? We don't have a homeless shelter. How about that? No homeless shelter in a community. And how many people are you feeding every day, just to get an idea of how many About homeless? 350 meals. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we don't have a homeless shelter. Uh, we have a Salvation Army with 18 beds. We have city and county leadership that say we don't have a problem. I'm not, nothing about me is politically correct, so if I have been here, I'm sorry. But we have a huge problem. And when I said we use food, to get people in the door to develop relationship with them. These people think they're invisible. And I could go on forever. What's the biggest lesson I've learned? They're yeah. people. People are people. My best friends don't have homes. They don't. But they would give me their last dollar. Or their only cigarette if I smoke. Or whatever I need. They take the pair of socks off their feet because that's the community they live in. Talk about the children that you see that are homeless, and uh, I'm guessing it's you know it's not hundreds of them, but you do see them. Well, um, uh, um, Kayla, I brought a colleague with me. You can correct me. Um, in the school system in Victoria, last year we had over 700 homeless students. Now that's McKinney Vento, correct? So yeah. that's a little bit different definition, but they're couch surgery there. Uh, they're living in It's cars. still tragic. They're, it's horrible. Kayla? A, a fact about our school district is this past year we lost out on $2 million federally, and this year we're anticipating 3 to $4 million federally being lost due to lack of attendance, due to food insecurity, housing insecurity, and some health issues, and the school district is crying out for help. So we're, we're in a world of hurt. Um, yes, we get a lot of children in. I have truancy officers that come to the kitchen because they want to identify the truants because mommy and daddy can't afford the $1.50 bus fare to get their kids to school every day. We don't have free transit anymore. COVID was wonderful in that area because our transit was free. Everybody got to ride free. Now we're back to charging people. Tr Trish, homelessness is a significant problem across the state. And we can Haven for Hope here in San Antonio, you can visit, you can visit yeah. the Homeless Coalition in Houston. I mean, all across. Uh, in and we do. City Square up in Dallas. I mean, so when you look at those uh, places, and, you, and all of them sort of have a different sort of way of approaching homelessness. Is there a better way, when we think of ourselves as a community about how we should approach homelessness, is there a better way of doing it? Or is it really just dependent upon the community? It's not a government problem, it's a human problem. And until we collaborate to work on the issue, we're going to have the problem. But there's so many facets that contribute to the issue of homelessness that I, I can feed people all day long, but if I can't connect them to mental health or health care or housing, and we have to talk too much yet, so. <laughs> but I Oh, just let her go. Just wait. But, what do we do? What do we do? And that's one reason why I wanted to come here today, is because I could talk, I could. I just want to sit here and ask you guys questions. Alan, did you have something you wanted to add to what Trish was? Yeah, absolutely, and, and, and ask the question, because you you, um, you described it right. Um, every, every city has a different way of approaching um, homelessness. Uh, and in Houston, uh, I, I, and the reason I know this, I served on the board and chaired the board of the Coalition for the Homeless in Houston uh, a few years ago. So I, I know a little bit about um, how Houston approaches uh, homelessness. And in Houston, it's um, permanent supportive housing. They decided to prioritize permanent supportive housing uh, over shelters, which gets to my question. Uh, and, and, and the reason for that, for those who, who don't know, permanent supportive housing 
you get them in a house, house, uh, a shelter, a place to live first. Housing and first. Housing yeah. first, and then you, uh, you know, get to the other issues that they may have: drugs, uh, food, whatever. What, we whatever love that needs. idea. Yeah. However, yeah. there are no units available, oh, God. and our, our, oh, <laughs> our a local authority family services organization. Um, they, they love permanent supportive housing, but they don't have enough workers in the field to make support possible. I have a guy that has been, had been on the streets 11 years before we got him housed. We got him into permanent supportive housing. He did not know how to live in a house. Nobody, and we thought, well, obviously they'll support Reuben and bring him groceries and teach him how to sweep the floor, make a bed. Uh, in six months he was out because he did not know how to live in that community. His comfort zone was on the street where he still is today. Um, yeah. We don't have the support we need because there's not, nobody wants to in the field. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Trish. I, I, I want to get to Deb. Yeah. So, Deb, um, one of the long-standing heads of United Way across the state, one of the leaders of United Way, and so, and United Way, it's different in every community as well, right? Yes. But I mean, you have been engaged in, uh, in a lot of things in El Paso. Yes. So you hear this conversation, you see the data that we're talking about. When you think about what you guys have done that sort of makes sense, and, and some of you may be doing it already, but the things that sort of make sense as you move to sort of mitigate some of this data that we're talking about. Right, so, um, and you're absolutely correct. Every United Way, every community that has a United Way, um, that is a local organization with the local board of directors and they're meeting the needs of, of that individual community. So what we do in El Paso is very different. And again, I want to commend the United Way here in San Antonio. They're doing some amazing, wonderful work, and same with Dallas and Houston. Uh, those are very, very large United Ways, you know, much bigger than the United Way in El Paso. But I would say that one of the things that, that, we, that I think in El Paso we've done is recognize um, the value of uh, an organization that can create strategic relationships that can um, be a value add beyond just um, taking dollars from donors, which is kind of the foundation of United Way is taking dollars from donors and then allocating them out to other organizations. Um, so what we really recognize is that we could do that, that we could bring in additional resources into the community from state, federal, and large foundations. Um, but I think one of the things to, that we're now, and again, I, I, I want to say this in a way that I, I'm gone, I'm not there anymore. I've been gone now for almost 21 days, um, <laughs> 23 days today. Uh, but in, And that is that Recognizing, I talked about a little bit at the beginning, collaboration. It's not really just referrals. It's ha but one of the things is, is that we are now requiring for our funding, um, we got so focused on outcomes. You know, donors want outcomes. Donors want to know that their dollars are making a difference. And we came so focused on that, which again, and I'm the first one to say, what a stupid thing to focus on. If we're making a difference in somebody's life, that's an outcome. Um, but I think now we need to focus on, again, threading those issues around, so making sure that every person in our program is getting some way of learning about um, uh, uh, understanding fiscal, how to, be, how to do budgets, even as a child, families, mental health first aid. You know, making sure that we are making sure that every single program we're funding, their staff are trained in mental health first aid making sure that every family we're, we're funding through a program, they're really a concerted effort to make those families aware of and encourage and create that relationship and that sense of confidence for SNAP programs. And the way you will also need to make it look at is, you know, SNAP is a great program for local businesses, for local jobs, for, you know, it's, it, is, it is the program that is really, um, there's so many programs that we need to change the way we, we talk about them and the way we present them to communities. I mean, that is, we need to change our language. And to, to Dr. Bob's point, you know, we're red state. We were the, we were the victims of, of a tragic shooting and we're the lead organization for the long-term healing. You know, it was incredibly horrible because 
this person drove 12 hours to kill our people, which right, is just right. beyond the concept of anything we could talk about. So, but we can't talk about that, but we can talk about after school programs, we can talk about mental health, we can talk about belongingness, we talk about you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and we talk about that in certain senses, but let's talk about making sure that out of, that out of school time programs for youth are inclusive. You know, let's make sure that these children are finding a place where they're not going to the dark web to find evil, that they are finding a place to belong. Let's have that conversation. Those are conversations we can have without making them political, without making, but you know, again, they're not the solution, they're not gonna, but let's use every quiver in our arrow. You know, every arrow we have in our quiver. Let's figure out how to do that. And I think that's really what we're trying to do in El Paso and recognizing that we're hearing this all around, rethinking what we're doing, how we're doing it, and why we're doing it, and making sure that we're having those conversations with other people, not just our funders, but with our other partners. Change the language, change the conversation. Jim, you wanted to follow up? I just wanted to echo what you were saying. I, I did a research study with youth across Houston, and the number one thing that they wanted, recreation centers. Mm -hmm. Wow. I, it, wow. And, and tell me that we can't go to to, yeah. elect, to to companies, to donors, to elected officials. That's not controversial. And think of that. Yeah. Mental health, exercise, going back to, to what, what um, Dr. Tavino was saying. I mean, all those things are tied, and we, but we're, we're putting them in these framing and these language that doesn't make sense and also makes it sound good. Like you talk about recreation centers. Oh my gosh, what an amazing thing. Roberta, you want to follow up on that? Yeah, just a, a little bit on the on outcomes. Um, you know, as a physician, if a patient comes in, I diagnose them with diabetes, I, I measure blood sugar A1C, I start them on a medication, I see them back in three months, and I need to measure. And I need to make sure that the A1C is below seven, and that the blood sugar is, is below 120. So in the Bienestar Lima, it's a coordinated school health program that's approved by the Texas Educational Agency. And uh, we have conducted three big trials. They're called cluster randomized trials, meaning that you don't randomize this group of children you get on this line at the cafeteria and this group of children get on this line at the cafeteria. We randomize schools. So we've conducted three studies, one of them in, in elementary, well, the first one was in elementary schools. When we went in there, we were checking blood sugars on nine-year-olds. And this is in Laredo with Dr. Hector Gonzalez, who was the director of the Laredo Health Department, and in San Antonio ISD. We found 9% of children with youth onset type two diabetes. These are nine-year-olds, and they're developing the adult type of diabetes. As an internist and critical care medicine doctor, you know, I'm, these children are going to lose limbs, are going to go blind, and they're going to not going to live to adulthood. Mm -hmm. So that's when we conducted this study. We tested again. We just because you have a good idea and you have a program, we cannot assume this population is beyond a good idea. They need evidence-based yeah. interventions. So in this elementary schools, we almost 1,200 children in, uh, in Laredo and San Antonio, we were checking their blood sugars. I am a wimp for a finger stick. <laughs> I, I, I don't like needles. But 75% of the families of these children were giving us consent to, to get, and they were all in line yeah. in the morning, yeah. and they were all excited. And I was looking at them, and later I realized that these children are growing up with grandmother that went blind mm -hmm. with uncle that lost a limb and on and on and on and these children don't want to live like that they they really want to improve so we we measured their, their finger sticks and then we followed them over two years and over two years the children in the schools that had the bienestar nima we were able to decrease their blood sugar levels and children that are were in the control schools their blood sugars went up and so this study was published in the Archives of Pediatrics and Adolescent Medicine. So then, because the rate of diabetes, or the adult type of diabetes, occurs between the age of nine and the age of 12, which are middle school children, that's when uh, they go through puberty. And puberty is a very strange period. 
where their blood sugars go up physiologically. Mm -hmm. Their insulin go up, their body fat increases, but when they pass puberty, all these come back to normal. They stay with the physiological ranges, the insulin, the glucose, but then they come. But if these children are growing in a, a obesogenic environment, these blood sugars just keep going at A1C and we're diagnosing children with the adult type of diabetes. So the second study we did in middle schools, and this was in five states, 42 middle schools, to test our curriculum. These are all NIH grants that we were funded, over $25 million of these grants. First of all, you know, the, the, the center that I work for, Social and Health Research Center, it's, it's a small little center. And uh, I'm not affiliated with the university, and I don't think I would last too long in the university. They would probably kick me out because I would scream out when there's injustices. And so um, we were funded to study. It was $11 million. And we followed uh, sixth graders all the way to eighth grade. Again, we randomized. So the 42, 21 were in the Bienestar Lima curriculum, and 21 were controlled. And we were, again, checking blood sugars, insulin, you know, adiposity levels, of course, so on. At the end of the study, we were able to decrease insulin level, decrease obesity rates, and, uh, and, uh, and lower glucose. And that study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So the earlier you catch them, the better the results. Early education is important. So we were just funded $2.8 million to do a study in the Rio Grande Valley, in, in uh, Fasa Juan Alamo and La Jolla. I don't know if you've ever been to La Jolla, and it's not La Jolla by San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is uh, one of the most richest. This is La Jolla, Texas, where... One of the most poorest. Yeah, 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 so. <laughs> and so these are, we did it, it's preschools. We started working with four-year-olds. And these four-year-olds make more sense than adults. They were amazing. So we randomized 28 preschools in these two school districts. 14 were in the Bienestar Nima, and 14 were in the control. And, um, and we're still in the, in the study, but we already published a paper that came, came out last month in the Journal of School Health, where the children in our Bienestar, they were able to improve their cardiorespiratory fitness compared to the control. Cardiorespiratory fitness is related to, again, diabetes, cardiovascular disease. So these children are being programmed developmentally. So we need interventions to again and, and test them. Yeah, it's very good. The, the, and, and the work that you guys are doing at Venus Sinema is, is uh, leaders in the state, right? So it's to, for you guys to be here in San Antonio, it's fantastic. Deb, I wanted to do one follow-up, and then I want to open it up to some of the, do we, are we getting questions from that? A lot, OK. So briefly. I'll make it brief. Yeah. Um, one of the things that's, that El Paso has in uh, connection with San Antonio is that large military establishments, right? So that's part of your community. We haven't talked about that. What does that, you know, sometimes people think, well, everyone's working, but a lot of low-income families in the military community. So talk about maybe some of the things that we should be looking out for. Sorry, that's a, a really great question, and I think there's two pieces to that. Um, I think obviously the military also tends to be a little bit of a closed um, community, and I think Mary could probably address this better than anyone. So sometimes they're they're hesitant to admit that they have issues um, because they feel like you know the, the feeling is the, you know the military takes care of their own. So there's a kind of double-edged piece to this. And number one, that um, they want they want these families to seek out military support for whatever challenges they're having. But there's also, in, from the military, especially from some of the younger uh, members of the military community, they, there's a, a stigma and they're afraid, again, kind of back to why people don't seek out some of the public benefits. They're afraid to go to their um, military resources for mental health, for domestic violence, for food, for um, uh, financial education because they don't want it to affect their career. So they're seeking services outside the base. So it becomes a very interesting relationship that, that many um, local organizations have in serving military families but doing it in a way that is um, so it's, it's, it's been an interesting relationship yeah. that we continue to develop, and it evolves depending on the leadership of the military right. also. Yeah, very. All right, do we have a good question, Mary? We have several, so... Give us um, the best one. I, I'm going to combine... Um, one of them is for Dr. Perino, 
Uh, one, it says your passion gradually shines. So the first question was, is why did you change your shift of focus from medical to early education? But in that, the another question that ties in this is, you spoke about obesity. Um, what are the panel's view on technology and, and the impact of lack of physical activity with youth and adults? And what can we do to improve physical activity from a federal health, better health amongst the families? So we'll keep this as brief as possible so we can get many questions. So first off, the switch for, to early education, I don't know that you made a switch, but you're, you're focusing on that. Yeah, no, I'm done with medical. I, <laughs> <laughs> so again, the, the, the question is, why did I shift from the medical <coughs> to public health? It has to do with money, and, and not the money that I made. I made a lot more money running the intensive care unit than going into a school. But the point is that uh, when I was taking care of people in the intensive care unit, my most common disease was chronic renal failure and stage renal disease. And those, um, I would stabilize them, send them home, and uh, in about four months, six months, they're back in the ICU. And you know how much we pay for care for a patient on end-stage renal disease? $80,000. So I said, what am I doing here? You know, imagine you buy a car and you pay dearly, and then in six weeks, you have to take it back to the dealership because it didn't work. So I said, you know what? I'm going to stop the critical care and open up primary care clinics in the poorest neighborhoods. So I opened up these clinics and to care for an uncomplicated patient with diabetes is $13,000 a year. But the number of people that were coming into my front door diagnosed with diabetes, were, it was enormous. The rates were going up and going up. And then I said, you know what, this is not the solution. Because, you know, again, you give them medicine, you go up on the medicine, and then you add a second one, then you start them on the insulin, and then they come to the point, they come with a back with medicines like this, and you pull out the medicine, and the bottles are empty, and I tell them, why aren't you taking your medicine? Doctor, I can't afford it. So that's when I took on my white coat, and I went on into the schools, and uh, since 90, 1995, we've been developing these curriculums and testing them, and. And, uh, and for $3 a year that a child pays for these curriculums, we've lowered glucose, insulin, decreased obesity, and improved cardiovascular fitness. To get to, the, to get to the second part of the question, I'd like to hear from a number of you, maybe Alan, Jamie. Uh, physical activity amongst kids, right? All of us see the decrease amongst physical, but is there one thing to blame, or is there a couple things to blame? Super, super briefly, Professor? TV. TV is the thing to like. What do you think? I, I have a 12-year-old daughter, um, and it's it's all things uh, technology, uh, including TikTok, uh, and, <laughs> including TikTok. <laughs> uh, but if we get it to turn it turn it off, uh, that's the challenge, and that's one of the things that we're having such a struggle with as a. Um, uh, um, me and her mother, we, we don't live together, um, but we do co-parent, uh, and, and trying to force her to kick her out the door just to get her outside to go play um, is a freaking challenge. But what we, have, what we decided to do as an alternative is to put her in, um, in, in sports. So she yeah. plays volleyball yeah. and uh, the soccer and, and all these things to kind of get her, uh, get her physical, physically moving. Jamie? Trauma. Trauma. Yeah. 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 I can explain a little bit more if you want me to. Super, super briefly. By show of hands, who has heard of adverse childhood experiences? Perfect. There you go. <laughs> 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 no, I will say. We sit around our office and figure out how many aces we each have, you know. And yeah. So the. Yeah. Right. I, I didn't ask that question, but yes. So just um, really quickly, the. That, that um, whole theory came out of a need to identify um, what was driving the increase of patients into this weight loss clinic in California. They decided to survey those individuals and what they started to see was there was a lot of trauma that these patients had, had experienced before age 18. Thus we get adverse childhood experiences. If you think about the triangle, the way obesity fits in, the way physical activity fits in is once um, a child is exposed to trauma, then they, they are at an increased risk 
for coping with that trauma in negative ways because we don't have access to mental health care. There's not enough counselors in the schools. We don't have early assessment, blah, blah, blah. So there are a number of things that children start to do that are unhealthy with drugs, smoking, sex, and, all, and, and eating, not exercising. So then as you go up that pyramid, you start to see all those unhealthy coping mechanisms starting to then impact the body. So you start to get lung cancer and chronic disease and, and those things. So that's how that kind of happens. But it, it starts with that exposure to trauma and not having that healing support. And whenever you talk about changing people's habits, you know, you, we have to be intentional. And Roberto talked earlier about the idea of health classes. You know, it's, that's a way of being intentional in terms of teaching people things that need to change. But when you have a state that eliminates health as one of the requirements and it's district by district, or you have a state that says, we don't have a PE policy, that's district by district or school by school, and schools say, well, we need to teach the test. So no health classes and no PE. Well, we're not being intentional about some of the key problems that we have. All right, number, another great question. Absolutely. So how does a child navigate through Latino pride when seeking mental health treatment? I would expand that to say, how does a child navigate when the parent also might not be comfortable on that? And then a follow-on with another person is, what are some other causes tied to mental health challenges and needs of children? So I want to start, because of the Latino part of the question, Deb, if we can start with you, and then we'll go to Jamie. So that's a little bit out of my wheelhouse, um, Mike, Mike. but I think one of the things that we've talked about, oh, sorry, I apologize. Um, I have such a loud voice, I just don't want to think about using the mic. Uh, anyway, so I would say that I think one of the things that, that I think, again, um, going back to what we were talking about, I think everything, uh, that inclusiveness, that belongingness, it is the sense, I think there needs to be a greater emphasis on the uh, social service organizations to make sure that that is included in every, whether it be um, youth serving agencies, early childhood, um, you know, family support organizations. It is how do you begin to, again, thread that into every aspect of the work that you're doing. And so that it isn't, I think one of the things if you start to do it um, as a set aside or as a, you know, focus on, it makes that more, you know, it makes it a, make it singling that child out of that person out versus just making it a part of the culture of inclusiveness. Jamie, this is a, a reality in pretty much every community. There's some sort of reason to not do mental health. So how, how do we overcome some of that? Education and reducing stigma first and foremost. Um, that's so important because the cultural aspects around seeking mental health are very impactful. And we're in a generation where, or where at the time, where there are some grandparents and parents that don't necessarily believe in mental illness or that believe in mental health or they, are, they connect that to more of a spiritual thing and they're like, oh, just go pray yes. about it yes. versus actually getting help. And so what I usually say is to a pastor, okay, if a, if a person walks up to you and their, their knee, their leg is cut, is broke, are you, what are you gonna tell them to do? They often say, oh, I'll tell them to go to the hospital. Okay, well, if a person is coming up to you and they're hyperventilating and they're telling you, I can't do this, I can't make it, I can't do this, what are you gonna tell them to do? oh, well, I'll sit down and pray with them. That's a problem because you're not recognizing the mental component, the mental illness of that, and, and really what we're doing is telling that person, it's on you, this is your fault, when it's not. So we need to understand that mental illness is a disease first and foremost. Then we need to make sure that we are expanding the workforce because we don't have enough individuals so that we um, are able to meet the need we have to think about expanding that workforce so that on both sides we can have psychiatrists and psychologists, but we can also have peer mentors. We can have CHWs that are in those schools acting as just taking a child and taking them for a walk for five minutes um, well, and then putting them back in class versus having to send them out of school because of behavior and then try to get an appointment. The other thing I want us to keep in mind is that it's not children's faults for their mental illness. Who controls the environment around them? Who? Parents. Parents. Who else? School administrators, community members, adults. Adults make these policies. Adults vote on whether to put parks or green spaces in a, in a school. It's adults. So we need to stop treating children as if they are the ones to blame for the results that we have 
on their mental health, on their mental wellness. When we're looking at them, yelling at them, screaming at them, you know, all these things that families do that, oh, it's okay, though, my parents did it to me and, and look how I turned out. It's like, no, you turned out good in spite of that happening. So we have to be more listeners and engage those young people in the conversation. And when they come to us, three things, listen, validate, and then reassure them, I love you, you are safe, we are gonna get you help. Break it up. Uh, just two. Okay, so one is um, some schools, it hasn't happened much yet in San Antonio, but I know this conversation, are shifting to four day school days. So are you seeing that affecting the other like social groups of health that you mentioned, such as with poverty, food, child care, mental health? The second one, I'll put it out here too. Uh, we'll do the second one, but oh. I, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the first one. <laughs> You know, if we want to see a lot of kids drop out, the best way to do it is to go to four-day school. Right. So I think that's really good. I feel like the, that superintendent will lose their job eventually when they do this. But any other thoughts about the four-day school week? I mean, I just think it's all horrible. It'd, it'd, it'd be interesting to see if there's any um, research data coming out yet. But I think anecdotally, I think we all have stories of, again, how it does increase um, risky behavior. Parents still have to work. It increases, um, again, food insecurity. So parents have, hate it. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. child care, yeah, it's, I mean, so I think. Unless they're in a flu and white mom who's at home, right? So yeah, you only need that. Yeah. You know, I mean, I have a really reality. That's a, that's a diminishing number, too. Um, so I absolutely, I don't really see that, that yeah. to your point, that's going to, it's not going to, it's a trend that's not going to last. Any other thoughts about the four days? Real quick, in all the studies we, that we do, and uh, when we're able to improve these uh, health measures, the summer comes, and when they come back to school, these measures tend up again. So the only hope of improving the health of these children is school. which increased the value of homes, property taxes. We know we talked about gentrification, but another piece on that is on that social cohesiveness that our older neighborhoods have, where you have multiple generations in those those communities, and now when they lose that because they can't afford, you know, kids can't afford to live in the neighborhood where their families are, their parents were and grew up, now they have to move elsewhere and they lose that support. Alan, you want to take that? Yeah. Um, uh, a lot of, uh, briefly, uh, a lot of times the emphasis is on um, the production of housing, uh, but it's also, it, but we also need to include the preservation uh, of, of housing as well, uh, which means including the um, uh, those families who who live who live who, who currently live uh, within those neighborhoods where gentrification uh, is happening, uh, and so what that means is um, applying some of these resources. Uh, that are currently out there available. One is um, um, uh, nonprofits that are that are focused on uh, repairing homes for for seniors, uh, like a, like for example, an organization called Rebuilding Together. Uh, they focus on they focus on that. Another example is is also to consider what I mentioned earlier, which is the community land trust uh, to to put homes in community land trust so that those homes. Uh, can remain affordable uh, as the as the overall overall neighborhood uh, neighborhood uh, appraisal is going up. Uh, the community land trust helps to protect some of that. Uh, I want to ask you guys one last sort of closing question. It has to be a super brief answer, but knowing what we know about Simon, please, please disagree. <laughs> with <what> you <laughs> oh, I agree. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, again, uh, you know what what single item can make a big impact in this community? At least for us, it's been educational technology or ed tech. Uh, when COVID hit, um, our curriculums, evidence-based, were sitting on shelves. They were not being implemented. So once we converted all our curriculums to educational technology, first, there were, there were videos, films, stories, you know, lively experiences. And second, we could reach them and they were at home and the library. So educational technology. Yeah, very good. Alan. Uh, I agree. Um, um, with, with the, but let me expand yeah. on, on, on the housing related piece, piece of policy and education, uh, which is a good model uh, that we can learn from San Antonio. 
Um, San, San Antonio has done a, a, a 10 year housing plan uh, that, that it's currently in. And I think the, the person who runs it is Mark Cremona. I think that is his name. Okay, I see a lot of heads now. Okay, good, that, that's his name. And, 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 and the plan is called SHIP, that's the acronym. Please forgive me, I forget what it stands for. I don't remember what it stands for, SHIP. Um, Houston does not have a housing plan. Uh, that's one of the things that we need to learn from San Antonio, from Austin, and from Dallas, uh, and other, uh, other cities around the country. If we in Houston can develop a housing plan like San Antonio and all these other cities have done, the fourth largest city without a housing plan, that's a challenge. And one of the key points of developing a housing plan um, for all income areas is, is collaboration. We need to include uh, local government in there. We need to include builders and developers. We need to include the banks. We need to include the local uh, stake stakeholders. Uh, and we also, we also need to include some of our uh, partners outside of the housing space, including medical. It's interesting, like when you talk about the collaboration amongst the housing and bringing everyone together. I remember during the pandemic, and we were starting to do this whole no evictions during the pandemic, right? Try to stop evictions. Yet someone who's a big housing uh, advocate uh, from Avenue CBC, you know, with, yeah, Mary, Mary uh, she was quick to say, we can do this, but you can't, there are people who own those places that depend upon the livelihood of that rent. What are we doing for them? And it's sort of interesting yes. when people try to collaborate and sort of see the big picture, you see a lot of different things, right? Absolutely. I still said no eviction, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's just good sometimes. It's good. Hey, give our panel a big Thank you all for listening. Roberto, everyone else was just, was, so thank you guys very, very much. So uh, we're going to do a picture. So uh, Mary, come on up. And, oh, we're going to get a picture. Too. guys very much all right um, so as the uh, speakers make their way back Mary and I want to have a, a couple of uh, final remarks one uh, for us it's been uh, just our real pleasure to work with family service and to be able to be here in San Antonio we love San Antonio uh, we have a great relationship with a lot of the media here their interest in uh, children and families uh, is a reflection of the community right there's so much interest and you guys live here, so you understand, but it's interesting. We go to a lot of communities in Texas where the interest in families and children is not as high as what we see here. So uh, for us, it's a very special thing to be able to, uh, to be here in San Antonio and to be uh, sharing this data and sharing some of the expertise of people from around the state. So it's, uh, it's been a real pleasure. But I think the, the key thing, though, is that all of us need to act, right? I mean, that is the real key, is that whether it's voting, uh, as a community member or collaborating uh, but looking at this stuff and thinking about how as an organization can we be much more intentional about making this happen because what, what we have figured out is that without us being intentional no one else is doing this stuff right it's the nonprofit community putting pressure on on the, le the legislature has all the money and the government has all the money we have to put that pressure on there and we have to figure out how that works and so it's up to us to come up with ideas, to come up with the pressure, uh, to create the awareness. I think that's that's uh, the real important thing. So Mary, thank you very much for having us here. Oh, Bob, thank you so very much. Uh, first, I would love to thank Dr. Bob Sanborn and his team. <laughs> service team but I really want to thank all of you for giving up your Friday morning to come spend time and have this conversation which we hope will be an ongoing conversation across the community we are all doing tremendous work in our various sectors here and and too often that work still happens in silos um, but I think as you saw today and I, I want to answer that question you asked the panel about what's the one thing there oh, yeah. And, and yes, absolutely, that foundation of early child, high quality early child education is so important, but it is a foundation. 
I don't know a single child that has gone through a high quality early child education that doesn't say that they want to grow up, you know, and be a doctor or a football player or a rap star or the president or whatever. They don't say that. But even with those supports at the beginning, if we don't ensure we have those building blocks that are put in place by all of you in the work that you do across sectors, whether it's helping to ensure they stay in school and graduate and then go on to college or workforce development training somewhere so they can break that cycle of poverty that they might have gone up in, that we ensure that they have access to high quality education or health care and understand health literacy so they know how to access and afford healthy food and know how to keep themselves healthy with physical activity and mental health and everything else that they also know, you know, that how to live in a safe home and that they can live in a safe home in a safe neighborhood with all of their supports out there and that they understand the importance of how to ask for help and where to ask for help when they need it to obtain those resources, but just as importantly, to know that they are valued, that they have purpose in life, that we need them to be a part of our communities and be contributing to our communities. If they don't have all of that, then we're failing them and they are derailing along the way. So those kids that get access to high quality education, pre-K and all that head start, whoever, whatever we're doing, how many of them at some point, you know, don't have those doors open to them? Those very institutions that exist to help support them are failing them for all sorts of institutional life barriers here. We've got to break down those barriers, help open those doors, help them see that doors exist, help them climb over those walls, whatever you want to say about that. And we have to do it together. We have to collaborate. We have to realize we can't nor should we work in silos in our own sectors. We can pat ourselves on the back every day saying we're doing great work, but we have to do it together. And that means educators, that means healthcare systems, that means all the other community-based organizations, that means our government. And we so appreciate when our local government is engaged, which we see it here in San Antonio, but also at the county level, and we need our state and our federal level. We need businesses, our, you know, our, they're the ones that you know make our economy run, but our economy can't run without our people, and our people can't be successful and thriving and happy and healthy without all the work that all of you do in this room. So that's why we have to come together and look at all the social determinants of health together, not just in a vacuum, or we will always worry about how do we feed some today and keep a roof over their head tonight, which is only addressing those symptoms, not addressing and, and changing the dynamic on those root causes. So thank you all so much for being here. Again, give us feedback on this. We are gonna be planning one hopefully again next year in this, but separately we have other things already going on locally. It's how to bring us together in ways that we haven't done before because we've got to do things differently and better. We owe it to our communities, to our families, and our children because they are our future. Thank you. When you, when you guys are doing your Facebook and your social media, make sure you tag us and make sure get, this gets the word out as well. And uh, you won't decrease your exercise by using social media. Just, uh, <laughs> uh, and I also want to thank on our team, uh, I want to thank Kim, and Charles, and Bill, uh, and Thank you very much. Thank you guys very much, and uh, hopefully we'll see you next year or sooner, right? <laughs>